first of all, my name is Joe Mullings. I'm super pumped to be here. Um, thank you so much. Um, and again, big thanks to Santosh for arranging this. Um, I mean, huge props on this and for our team too, for helping document this. We're gonna share this with all of you uh, after it's done, so. And I would ask you to ask as many questions as possible. We purposely jumped into Q&A as quick as possible because we think that's the most value for you. Um, so let me just start out. So to my right is Norbert Johnson. Norbert has over 20 years experience developing medical devices in the areas of surgical navigation, medical imaging, and robotics. He's currently the VP of Robotics and Imaging and Navigation for Globus, which he helped found in 2014. Yep. Uh, and is currently developing robotic and navigation systems for spine and cranial surgeons. Uh, he also co-founded Breakaway Imaging in 02 and served as the VP of R&D for design and development of the O-Arm, um, which was sold to Medtronic in 07, where you stayed for a while and served as R&D director. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bachelor of Science Mechanical Engineering from my neck of the woods in Florida, FAU, and a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from Tufts, an innovator throughout his career, over 50 issued patent, uh, patents um, and pending patents. Uh, next up. Uh, it's Harel Gadot, and where am I, Harel, on you. So Harel, executive and entrepreneur in the healthcare space, experience in leadership positions in the corporate world as well as the startup sector. Um, Harel founded MedX Ventures uh, and serves as the CEO and chairman of Microbot Medical, where he co-founded the company. He's also chairman of Exact Robotics, an early stage medical device venture, and MedX Accelerator, and a partnership between MedX Ventures Group Boston Scientific and Intellectual Ventures and Sheba Medical Center. Um, he served as Worldwide Group Marketing Director at J&J &J earlier in his career uh, and a former professional basketball player, which I think is the most impressive out of all of that. You, you know the movie White Men Can Jump? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at us. <laughs> he holds a BS in Science uh, uh, from Siena, a Masters, an MBA, and from Manchester University in the UK. And on uh, the end is Todd Usen. Todd is currently the CEO of Active Surgical. Previous to that, he was president of Medical Systems Group at Olympus of the Americas, where he helped lead the expansion from six medical divisions to 11 in 3.5 years. Prior to Olympus, Todd held the position of president of orthopedics at Smith & Nephew and has held several other leadership roles for Smith & Nephew as well as BSC. Um, he did his MBA at Pepperdine and graduated magna cum laude from the Eisenberg School at UMass. So uh, quite a panel here in such an intimate setting. And I'm Joe Mullings. Um, I've been in the search business since 1989. Our firm is the number one search firm in the world based on placements, more than 7,000 placements with over 500 companies with especially a focus in imaging, navigation, digital health, surgical robotics. Um, so done a little work and all three of these gentlemen I've worked closely with so I've been fortunate enough so um, welcome all of you <coughs> and I'm just start out from all three to put perspective down how do you define and segment the healthcare robotics market and where do digital health surgery diagnostics and AI fit into it Harrell you want to start us out on that one sure thank you first of all guys thank you for uh, inviting us and uh, come here today. Let me start a little bit on a different uh, thought around this, okay? How many of you have been on an airplane lately? Any issues getting on an airplane? Any different thoughts? How many of you thought that actually a robot is flying you? Have you ever thought about it? You know that, right? That 10% of the flying is done by a pilot. But for some reason, all of us can get on an airplane, go up 30,000 feet in the air, and don't even think about it. It's not just us, you guys. It's the pilot, it's the FAA, it's even the flight attendants, right? So why still physician will say, many physicians, and you probably have this experience, I will never let a robot replace me. <laughs> He's laughing because I assume you heard that many times. That's, I heard that, that. that's what they tell me, yeah. That's what they tell you. <laughs> why do we still hear the fact that patients still want to see a doctor and you have all this variability between somebody who get a lot of cases in New York City or Boston and versus somebody in mid-America or the developing market. And we have this huge variability that happens because of one factor only, surgical skills. So when you ask where the robotic is and everything else, we, we call it robotic, but it's really not robotics. You look at all the 
robo robots out there, it's actually robotic assisted surgery. Mm -hmm. So think about it. It's kind of like having an autonomous car that you still need to drive it. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to take away the number one issue for accidents in cars. We also want to take the one thing in robotics that will democratize surgery. And it's not about replacing the surgeon, in my opinion. It's really enhancing the skills. If you talk about surgeons, the way I view it, they have two skills. Intellect skills, the ability to see and to know, and their technical skills. If we can take the variability of the technical skills through robots and enhance their capability through AI, deep learning, better imaging, so they know how to read better imaging, help the robots make better decisions, but help kind of like democratize the surgi surgery itself, that no matter where you're going to see uh, a physician, if it's in mid-America, if it's in China, you're going to get the same surgery. That's where I believe we're going to see the future of surgery going. And, and again, why are we all getting on an airplane today and we don't think twice about a robot flying us? It's because the pilots accept it compared to the physicians. We, like the patients, accepted it. And the FAA, if you compare it to the FDA, for example, accepted it. So once we get everybody to accept it, I think we're going to be in a very different place when it comes to the surgical robotics, at least. Okay. Thank you. Robert? So I think people accepting surgical robotics, but I kind of just go on that, as, you know, as we build robotics programs, like for us, it's not just selling a robot. We want a hospital to truly accept this robot and, 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 and build usage around it. And we help them develop a program. And part of that is helping them advertise in their community, right? That, hey, we have a surgical robot now. And you know, if you want your surgery, come here. We have the latest, greatest tech. And, and so they're doing that. So obviously, at least the patients out there believe it's a positive. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe now is a good time for this, because the fact that they're advertising it, not hiding it, and, and they're trying to boast that they have these technologies. Um, so I think, I think the time is now. I think, and to your point, I, I agree 100% in that they're robotic assisted. We're not trying to get rid of the surgeons. I kind of laugh because when we were doing our first labs, this, the surgeons made comments like, oh, I guess I'm going to be out of a job in, in 15 years. I'm like, I don't see that ever happening, to be honest. There's too much variability and setup and everything else, but we can help improve. For us, the big metrics are time, dose, and accuracy, right? Let's speed up the procedures. Let's do it with the up nose accuracy really standardizing accuracy across the different levels of surgeons and reduce extra <coughs> exposure, right? So you, you don't have to expose uh, the patient or the staff, you know, every day. So that's big, our big drivers. Awesome. Todd? Well, not to go too deep and in, in, in add on, but it's, uh, I felt like after you were done, I'm, we just put our whole marketing play out there. And uh, <laughs> um, Active Surgical, I, I left big, big, big companies. Uh, similar to Harrell, um, and, and the last three companies were, you know, they're all top 20 medical device companies, and we would be looking at companies like Active Surgical, where, where, where I came to now. And Dr. Peter Kim, who, who started this company and founded the technology, started it. He did the first autonomous surgery two years ago on a live animal. That was the first truly autonomous suturing, meaning it was a couple clicks, and the robot did the work. Now, there's, you know, to get to that point, there's a lot of work that went in, and, and at the end of the day, you know, if I was in an autonomous car right now, and a little dog ran in front of me, I'd reach for the brake. There's no, I'm not just letting it go by itself, even though I'm, it could happen. So we're going to get there, and so I believe the future is there. So in a way, I came knowing that that's where, they, where we started, and now it's how do I continue to uh, work the path to get, to bring the company and bring medical to that place, knowing that we have those capabilities, but still, it, it's about imaging. It's about what you see, which is uh, what will help the physicians. And at the end of the day, it is supervised. It's supervised surgery. Any surgeon, you know, who's been in surgery, right? When you um, work with a, the, the, whoever's led your, your surgery, the, the, the chairman of the department, the head of the department, the, the big wig, he or she is, you know, whether they're boisterous or not, they want the same assistance with them every case on the real high-tech stuff. That's a fact. It's not a, they would love to have the same team, super team, if they could on the highest risk mm -hmm. surgeries. Well, I mean, ultimately what robotics and, and some of the work that's being done is we're going to give them at least that, that first assistant. 
that's going to be consistent. It's going to provide them the data. It's going to provide them the, the visualization. It's going to provide machine learning, operating it from on the edge, as well as taking d data from the cloud. So I think the, the, it's not going anywhere. I mean, it's, uh, it's, we have to also temper the expectation. I think the pilot is a great comparator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the technology that these guys have been working on is, the technology is probably ahead of where their society is ready to accept it, so it's up to us to, to get society there. Yeah. And, and Joe, there's one more thing. Congratulations to two of you. You just reduced the gap for future surgeons <laughs> by two. But in 10 years, we're going to have a gap of 30,000 surgeons in the U.S. alone. Who's going to replace them? Mm -hmm. Who's going to replace them? Oh, let me say, okay, we're going to have a longer wait time. Great, I have cancer, I'll wait another month because we have <laughs> shortage. Think about it. We need to fill that gap. Who's going to fill that gap? Not me. I'm not going to be a surgeon, right? If you ask my advice, I'm probably going to tell my girls, don't do that, there's no money in it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> although, although, you know, ask my Jewish mom, there's only two jobs, doctors and lawyers. So maybe she will push for that, <laughs> right? But, but think about it. 30,000 surgeons in 10 years. We got to close this gap. And yes, we can replace surgeons with technicians. Technicians mm -hmm. today can do some things, not today, but in the future, can do some things to help the physician focus on the surgeons what they need to do best. And it's understand and know, or see and know. And I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time, <laughs> but I can tell you an example. I can tell you an example of one of our companies where the surgeon said, I will never let a robot because I really need that tactile feel, to feel that tactile mm -hmm. feel. And it took us a year, we came back with the results. He said, actually, I want the robot. Yeah. But the fact that we still need to push through this, that's where we are today. And as we all said, I believe, it's a hump we're going to go over. And once we go over it and say that rightfully so, we're going to see 17, 20 companies in the OR, and it's going to boom. Yeah, and it also extends the life of the surgeon as well. And we Absolutely. all know that. So oh, yeah. if Absolutely. you look at some of the surgeries that are done, they're quite, Norbert's, platform um, greatly reduces exposure to x-ray, Yep. right? You look at the intuitive platform, it saves the shoulders and the backs of the docks. You look at the Corindus platform, uh, it keeps the lead vest off of them. Mm -hmm. So you can go down the That's list okay. of extending the life of the surgeon uh, and their skill set. Right? Any yeah. questions on that subject or clarity required on that from anybody right now? There's a question about extending the life of the surgeon. Um, so I think when we think about sort of value-based care and setting outcomes for doctors, one big concern is that if you start getting rid of the bad doctors or the underperforming doctors, there's a shortage, and so it just makes it worse. Does this, does this kind of robotic technology um, allow these kinds of surgeons that might not have the best outcomes to have better outcomes and increase the number of surgeons? That would, Go ahead. That would be the plan. Yeah. I mean, um, in the value-based healthcare right now, and um, value-based is there's, there's three the triple aim of healthcare, it's, it's making for the patient, for overall population health, and then reducing costs. So what does that mean? Um, if a physician can, can go to the hospital, if a physician in healthcare can go to the payer um, and to the patient with repeatable, reliable, quantitative results, whether they're in their first case after they trained at Mass General, but they're, they're gonna practice in the University of Iowa or in a small town in Iowa, um, or any middle America town, it's, I'm not picking on Iowa. Um, you want to know that you can have the same outcomes, at least you're about the same data, the same technology, the same, um, in certain cases, the same robotic arms, the skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, simple hernia procedures can't be sutured. They have to be tacked in some situations because our arms don't get there. That's not even a complicated one. That's just a routine procedure, but it becomes complicated because the patient's not getting the best possible outcome because the, the capabilities of a surgeon, they can't move that way. You can't get to certain places. The tax will come out, come off. You have to go in other areas. So now the companies like Intuitive and other, there's handheld robots, companies like Flextex. You know, you can go and suture and I could, I could get up to any angle on a hernia. I mean, we wouldn't think that hernia would be one of the first things that people were looking at robots for, but that's why because a simple procedure like that, you can get a standard of care that some surgeons, you, no, the best surgeon is not always capable of doing things that they can do now. And, and if I, I want to address your point, your point, because the answer to everything you ask is yes, to everything. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Is, as, as we said here, is the fact that you're going to get the same treatment no matter where you are around the world. Now let me give you another example. Don't we want to treat patients earlier, to diagnose them earlier? 
to have personalized medicine. Let me give you a simple example. Do you know that most interventional radiologists cannot go after a one centimeter target? A one centimeter target. Meaning that if you have a one centimeter lesion in your lung, which is the deadliest cancer in the world, one centimeter, this is that big, they will tell you to go home <coughs> and come back when it's going to grow. Which one of you would like to go home with a one centimeter lesion in their lung and come back when it's going to grow? But companies like Exact Robotics, yes, it is one of my companies that can get to like less than one millimeter target. Isn't that what you want to do? To get those patients earlier? So that's one, thing, one option. The second one, a lot of hospitals don't have the skilled physician to do the surgeries, for example. So they send them to a better center, a more experienced. Guess what? They just lost a patient in the cancer treatment, which is a lot of money for the hospitals. Now you allow these smaller sites, not as experienced sites, to be able to create these revenue generating procedures for the hospitals. And then it's like this beautiful circle that they get more experience, more funds, more skills, and so on and so on. And that's where I see the physician being able to treat more patients, keep more patients in the hospitals, and then you don't have to go just to MD Anderson or Sloan Catering, <coughs> but you can get the same treatment with the same experience in other hospitals. Yeah. What, what we did with the robot, uh, so we're spine surgery, so we put pedicle screws in the spine, and you have to be pretty precise, kind of sub-millimeter type accuracy that you were talking about. If I was to say, here's a C-arm, take a couple, you know, AP lateral x-ray shot, and work through a small incision and see if you can put the screw in the right spot, you're gonna have to practice a long time before you could do that. We could take brand new sales guys that come in, and in about 30 minutes, they can put perfect screws in, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's hard to even read the x-rays now with this technology, it becomes very, very easy. And that, that really opened my eyes. And then the second example I have is, we had a surgeon, I won't say where, and I won't say who, he wanted to buy a robot, and he said, Norbert, is this gonna work every time, all the time, 100%? I'm like, well, doc, I mean, nothing works 100%, right? So, you know, maybe you have to buy two then if you need, you know, that, you need a backup, <laughs> right? He goes, I cannot do surgery without some sort of surgical navigation. I can't do it. Like, well, that's scary, first of all. But, like, there's actually surgeons out there now. He's a pretty unique guy. But most guys, if the technology fails, they'll just go old school and go back to the way they learned it. Yep. Right? But to have someone say, if it fails, I just close the patient up because I can't continue. Like, yeah. That, that's almost scary, right? That's like if the pilot, if the, if the autopilot fails, true. they better be able to land the plane. Yeah, true, true, well, you, you think about it. I mentioned that the democratizing surgery. Do you know, when I was, I spent time in orthopedics when I was at Smith and & Nephew. And the data, and some people have heard, heard me say this before, that 75% uh, of ACLs, serious procedure, arthroscopic, sports med, you tear your ACL, you see the athletes out for six months to 10 months and they're probably not on the field for till the next season, right? So it's serious. 75% of ACLs are done by physicians that do 10 or less a year in mm -hmm. the country. Yeah. 10 or less. Now that's because of where you are geographically or population or you still have to keep your lights on. So yes, you're going to always try to go to the, to the best um, sports medicine doctor in, in Boston versus going to the suburbs out in, in Massachusetts. But those doctors are doing them too. And then healthcare, the payers, to get to the value-based medicine, would love to know that the doctor that's doing 10 can have similar outcomes. Doesn't mean they have to be better, but similar outcomes of the doctor that does 260. Yeah. So. And, and to your point about navigation, how many of you can go from here to Boston, or where we are, we are in Boston, like to Hingham <laughs> or to New York City right now, without using Waze? Yeah. Think about it, right? Yeah. You're smiling, but we never think about it. Okay, I'm older than you, I assume, at least. I, I used to older. use, oh yeah, we used to use maps, right? Yeah. Maps, I mean, you ask me today, exactly. we all use We, we lost that skill, too. We, exactly. I used to drive from Boston to Florida by myself with an atlas in one hand, and I can estimate. Yeah, not, that hard. not anymore. <laughs> so, that skill's lost. So, so, he's so, he's so, an orthopedic guy, you have to excuse him. So, when Joe, so think about it, when Joe asks about the future. It's one road. Yeah, so when Joe asks about the future of robotics. <laughs> nice. Just think That's about it. That's a long it. way. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a question from this. Oh. And then later. We're having too much fun. Oops. Here, we should have fun. I, hopefully you're having fun, guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. We already got <laughs> one question thing. asked. Eat, please eat. Sorry. Please eat. <laughs> so is that not a concern for you guys and for the surgeons? Are, are there any people working on continued education or anything? Because as much as right, we want to rely on the technology, it's probably good if we can still read maps and pilots can fly, et cetera. So what's, 
I guess, what do you think about that in the future? Well, I think supervised. I mean, at the end of the day, um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the physician. So, yes, I, I entered the world that has uh, robotic autonomous play is, is one of the appealing things, but there's a lot of surgeries going on today before we get to that play. So my role is, you know, I want to make sure that we're making the life as easy as we can or the data um, as good as it can be for the practitioner. I count on surgeons. I want to make sure that the education levels are great. I mean, things with robotics, the, 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 if you're running a business, the money making is not in training. But you want to make sure every business that you run has a training component because what physicians can learn on new technologies, in the past it was, it was all cadaver, uh, animal lab, or other models. But now with even the technology that's available, there's a lot of training and, and work that can be done through robotics. Um, and um, augmented uh, reality and, and different mm -hmm. the virtual reality and different things that the physicians can do. So if you're asking, are we worried that we're going to be replacing or moving surgeons to the side if there's not enough that are educated or trained? Um, or are you talking about... Skills as we become dependent I, th I think the skills change. Yeah. When's the last time? They're not teaching script in school anymore, cursive. Everyone has to still sign their name, yeah. but that doesn't make the student dumber than they were when we were writing cursive. They're learning skills that I didn't learn in school. They're, they're smarter than I am now, right? I mean, so it all depends on the market that you're in, the time that you're in. We're in an age that, um, has it, did anyone take two, three years of cursive when you're in school? I did. It's like, yeah. I still can't write it, I, but I did. <laughs> but I mean, uh, and, uh, other than your signature, how much do you, ha you write? You need to know how to, Typing's different that you learn now because typing on your computer. So I, I don't think it's uh, they're gonna their skills will erode. I think their skills will evolve to the technology that's available. That's the best technology, just like everything else in life. I think you're asking a great question. Yeah. And let me give you an example: stroke management. Okay, time is brain. How I many of you heard that? Time is brain. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: if you get in at 2 p.m. into a hospital you're probably in good shape. Why? Because you have the surgeons with experience that know how to get to you in time and remove the, the stroke, okay? The, um, the blockage, or whatever mm -hmm. you call it. If you get at 2 a.m. and all of a sudden you don't have this expertise, you're pretty much screwed. Mm -hmm. We forget that there's another part of robotics called telesurgery. Remember that. We talk about AI. We talk about deep learning. How about telesurgery? The fact that, for example, if you know somewhere that don't have the experience, but you can call a call center, okay? That you have this expert that can log in to from miles away into the system and do the surgery because they have the skills, then you don't need to have the skilled surgeons in every site, which today it's impossible, especially we're gonna have 30,000 surgeons gap. So the way I see it is to the fact that we're gonna have this center of excellence that's going to be somewhere where if you really need uh, somebody that needs to add additional experience to the robot itself, they can log in, they can help do the procedure from distance, and they will have the skills that we can focus on. I think that will close a lot of the gap, going back to the fact that the fact that you have a surgeon next to you doesn't mean you're going to get the right treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that recently, um, I think Corindus had just done, so for those unfamiliar or maybe familiar, Corindus originally came out of Boston and the intention there was a robot for the cath lab. Right. And I believe three months ago, uh, they did a first tele uh, surgical <coughs> procedure. Now their intention is they're pivoting from uh, cath lab into stroke. Correct. And it's uh, and, and I think it just happened in China last week. There was another yep. over the 5G network. Yep. Uh, they were able to uh, do a uh, telesurgical procedure. So that's not uh, pie in the sky stuff. That's mm -hmm. that's um, that's here now. Absolutely, it's right there. Two questions. So you can hold on to that. And pass it back. Oh. Um, so my question is along the lines of what you were talking about with democratizing healthcare and making this. Um, available or making these procedures basically available to smaller centers where they don't have the experience on hand. Um, so right now the fixed cost investment of one of these robotic systems is somewhere along 1.5 to 2 million dollars. So I was just wondering how do you see these points converging in the future where you have a smaller center that doesn't have an, maybe enough cases to justify such a high fixed cost. 
Um, do you see the price coming down soon in the future, or is there some way to reconcile that? I think competition brings pricing in, yeah. in line. And keeping in mind the numbers that you hear first, there was, a, there was one robotic company that was pretty much 15, 20 years ahead of the game. Not all of us are just coming out with a robot. I mean, there's different pieces of it, but the robotic companies that are out there now, um, I absolutely believe that once um, true competitors come out in, in the spaces that you have in the, in the big robot, Intuitive has been out there for a long time, and um, they were first. And it's like anything else. I mean, there, those prices will start to level set. Technology will change. Um, all robotic companies aren't going to be coming out with a robot. You know, some are going to come out with different technology, different software, different components of robotics. And it all fits under telemedicine. I mean, there's other pieces. But I, I think to answer the question, with that said, um, yeah, I don't think those those small hospitals might have the means to, to spend a, a million dollars on one robot right now. But it's going to be up to healthcare. It's going to be up to you and the studies and, and clinical work that's being done to prove concepts and outcomes. When outcomes get larger and the volume gets larger, 10% of surgeries are done with robots right now. So there's a lot of procedures being done without them, mm -hmm. right? So there's still only 10%. When that becomes larger, that's only going to grow when clinical data says it, it needs to grow. When, when companies, physicians, healthcare systems prove the worth, and then, I, and then I absolutely believe that as soon as competition becomes equal and other companies enter the fray with different avenues or uh, different value propositions, um, I absolutely am positive pricing will be more in line. Yeah, I think there's like two other aspects too, because a lot of a lot of the robotics Sorry. companies out, a lot of it's new, right? Our our robot's been out just a little over a year. Massive investments to get it out. Prices are pretty high right now, but you know, we need to pay back that investment too. And to your point, as competition comes up, yeah. and as volumes for us go up, we'll definitely be able sure. to bring bring prices down. But there's other models too. A small surgery center or whatever doesn't necessarily have to buy one; they could pay per use. Right, so you can, there's leasing models. There's there's other models without having that cash outlay. Absolutely. Um, you know, initially with the early adopters, like we don't have to go there yet, but that, that will happen in time for sure. I think there's one yeah. missing part to your question, which is not just the price. I think the days of this big dedicated robot that needs a dedicated room, and sometimes with a dedicated staff, mm -hmm. that's gonna go away. You're going to have small robots that you, they're going to be mobile. You can move it from one room to another. So you don't have to, you go to some of the big cancer centers, you see C eight, 10 dedicated CDs, CTs. Do you need eight to 10 robots? Not necessarily. You get to the point where it's small enough. So I think the pricing will drive it away. And you have to remember the business model of robotics, it's very exciting. It's capital equipment, it's disposables, it's service, and moving forward, it's data analysis. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, we can work with the centers to fit our model differently to each center. How do we as a company generate revenues while the center and the patients get the right treatment? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think CAT scanners are a good way to look at it because yeah. if you look at just what X-ray did, in the beginning I would imagine MRIs, CAT scanners, they were way up there. Huge. Now you can buy like a GE Lightspeed for what, 300,000 yeah, maybe, yeah. You know, exactly. something like that. C-arms, right? C-arms, each surgery right. um, theater, there's probably 10 C-arms in the hallway, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And so if one fails, you just go grab another one. Yeah. They're like pieces of furniture. And those are probably hundred fifty to $250,000 mm -hmm. yeah. devices. You know, not million dollar devices, but, but they have them. And then the other thing that's interesting is they have a role in the hospital called an RT, a radiological technician, and they run all the equipment. So a surgeon, they, they go in there and they don't have to worry about this technology because there's this technologist there that runs that stuff. And a surgeon told me so one I'm time, I love this it. line, and this is actually a problem. When it comes to RTs, you either get Frankenstein or Einstein, you don't know which one you're gonna get. He goes, I started out a conversation one time like, this is up, right? <laughs> this is down, right? But, but, wow. but this person uses technology. Yeah. I think with robotics and navigation, we're gonna see like a navigation tech role appear in the hospitals, oh, yeah. just like an RT. And then they're gonna be, know how to use yeah, this equipment. Exactly. Our robot wheels in, like, op, uh, surgeries are long, four or five hours, depending on the surgery. They'll use our robot for an hour. They bring it in, drop stabilizers down, do their yep. thing, five minutes setup. They take it out, bring it to another surgery, just like they would a CR. You know, that's, that's that yep. model. And there'll be a dedicated tech. Right now, that's what we're all trying to figure out, who runs the equipment, you know? Right. So. so on that, if I can jump in on that too. So right now, unfortunately, people are comparing robots to Intuitive. And that's a $1.5, $1.7 million platform. 
ensure J&J &J is developing a similar platform and an ecosystem to boil the ocean, and Medtronic is as well. Right, and, and, and I think so because that's been, everybody saw the success of a $60 billion cap on Intuitive, so of course we're business people. Um, having said that, then you have to look at the full proposition. The proposition is if you do get out there and you can bundle, so there's bundling. And so if you're going to boil the ocean, you better be able to offer a bundling situation where the big strategic gives away the robot, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then bundles the rest of the proposition into it. So it's really not a 1.5 million today and maybe 700,000 um, three years from now. So that's one. And then number two, this rolls into a question for the panel. Um, I think three or four years ago, the thought was let's boil the ocean with a full digital ecosystem. Or as I believe, uh, you can single and double your way into the OR with smaller platforms, smaller footprints, and smaller solutions. So I'm curious on each of your perspective, what does a large ecosystem and what inertia is that facing from adoption? Or are you better off getting in small footprint by small footprint, turn around one day and suddenly we've got a digital OR? So let me start with her elf on that one. It's, it's, it's a great question. The reason is it's because I, I happen to have a meeting this week with one of the largest companies in the world, right? And I met with um, very smart people from the venture arm and from uh, corporate development. And we, we spoke about one of our companies and they said, okay, so what is your uh, procedure that your robots are going to do? And we said, well, we're agnostic. We're agnostic. Our robot just tell us what the robot wants to do and it will do. And, and they're like, no, just what is this one procedure that we can get into the OR or the CT room? Or any, and we said, that's the past. The future, in my opinion, is the fact that you're going to have a robot that can do any procedure out there. So today we have very something very dedicated for spine or for joints, for example, and you may need that, those things, but think about 3D, right? Th 3D printing may change the way we view that. Mm -hmm. But we need to change, so in my opinion, we're starting by adapting our procedures to our robot to like one piece at a time, as you mentioned. But even intuitive surgical today, they started by focusing on urologists and cardiovasculars. Today, their number one procedure, hysterectomy, gynecology. So even intuitive today is a platform that many people can use. Mm -hmm. The way I see it, and it, you, you're gonna have some specialized robots, but eventually, Joe, I believe it's going to be you in there and you control the, not just the OR, but the treatment pathway. It may be the CT. It may be the OR and it may be a combination. There are a lot of procedures today where a surgeon needs to stop in the middle of the procedure and send the patients to do a biopsy or something. Why? Because they don't have the capabilities to do biopsy in the middle of a procedure. I think those days, those days will be gone. Mm -hmm. You're in the middle of a procedure, you're going to finish the procedure. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some technology, imaging, robot, whatever, mm -hmm. that will help you complete successfully a procedure. It's going to be there. Yeah. But right now, I think it's going to be like, I'm facing a problem, you guys at Global, something very yeah. specific or specific procedure, right? And then expand. Well, I mean, to your point, like if you look at our robotic platform, what we, what we told our customers, it's expensive, and we're trying to build a platform at which you can expand with new software and new tools, right. you can then do more procedures. So we, we started out in spine, but that's just the start. And I think to answer your question of like hitting that double, whether the device is big or small, for us, it's more about workflow, right? How can we improve that workflow? Like why yeah. send the patient out for a biopsy? And just how can we streamline that from skin to skin? And then even before that, right? Even before they hit the operating room and even after they leave, you know, that whole, that whole workflow, you know, I think is important. So yeah. I don't know what technology looks like. It's just how do you help that, that workflow? Todd, do you have anything on that? Well, not to, to belabor it, but the, the big boiling the ocean, I mean, it, a lot of that starts with some of the bigger companies. They feel like I'm going to go acquire this little one, this mm -hmm. little one, this little one, this little one. So it's still mixing and matching a bunch of s small technical pieces to make one big. I don't know, um, you know, the intuitives of the world, I think that's a great example. I don't think it's just for one procedure. It started one way. There's a, there's a mentality. When you're first, there's a lot of pros. There's a ton of cons. Everyone just wants to beat you. Um, you know, now it's, but I, I absolutely believe that um, singles and doubles works. Listen, I bunted a lot in college, so I believe in, you know, base hits. <laughs> you know, uh, games change a lot. It's, 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 you know, looking for three run homers now. But, uh, um, you know, I absolutely believe that 
y the goal is making sure we understand the outcomes from the physician and how can the technology that we're promoting, whatever it is, can be of advantage. And even if you have another carrier, I am a complete believer in hardware agnostic uh, technology. Active surgical will be a hardware agnostic technology, um, which means that I, all the hard work's been done, I have to prove my concept and I have to sit down and say, you can use it on whatever you have. And one of the things to keep in mind is, as a species, what we do is we tend to take forward-looking technology and apply it to the rearview mirror. Yeah. And so some of these questions today you're asking are totally legitimate, but what we have to do is realize where that tech is going to be leading us and not try and apply it to rearview mirror problems. And that's always the challenge in any market. There's also one variable that we keep forgetting. I'll be honest with you guys. I make the same mistake as well. We may want to have this great portfolio, platform, whatever you want to call it, and then comes the FDA. Hmm. And the FDA tells you, I'm sorry, you want regulatory approval, what's your predicate device if it's a 510K, and it's got to be the same as the predicate device, right? Yeah. And then you want to expand it, then you go to a PMA, and then it's a $50 million development. So when we think about the future of robotics, we've got to think holistic. Mm -hmm. Holistic. FDA, patient, mm -hmm. surgeons, companies, right. um, research institutes yeah. uh, coming from Israel, for example. We talk about the military. A lot of innovation from Israel comes from the military. One of my companies is, the, has, is in the middle of discussions with NASA. Why? Because some technologies, great technologies. So we have to remember all these variables because we're not, in a, we're not working in like a vacuum or in silo. Question? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I've got a question that's inspired by the conversation on kind of the practical realities of the business model. Um, and, and generally, it's what this looks like if it's successful. So if you have a number of players that have a general purpose robot, uh, but you're talking about a shrinking surgeon workforce, do you think the, the landscape of healthcare is going to be completely changed by access to robotics? Are there going to be either hospitals that specialize purely in robotics or breakout specialized surgery centers? Uh, is there going to be less training for surgeons? Are we going to find that more intervention is going to lead towards surgeon instead of medication because surgery is much easier? How do you see, um, if this is a success, how do you see it changing how, how hospitals and, and intervention runs these days? So think about where you are in your career right now. If you were to, whether you have or you have not uh, <coughs> selected a residency program and then or end or a fellowship, do you have specific criteria that you would say, I'm choosing a residency program that has telemedicine and robotics, or I'm not going to do it? Students are turning away hospitals that are accepting them now. So your uh, demographic right now, the group that's coming out and just got their MDs or what have you, you're choosing the future of training because you're basically forcing the hands of more institutions to make sure that they have the top equipment to train on what's futuristic. You don't. People are not looking to go get trained. Whether you plan on using a robot in, at all in your career or, or what have you, you're, you're not, you may not be as interested to go to a training program that doesn't have the top technologies and is not teaching futuristic medicine. And it's not even futuristic, it's current. So telemedicine, as was mentioned, robotics, as is mentioned. I mean, AI, it, it, now you're going to send the message to the teaching facilities so more and more will be training on this technology. I don't think there'll be less training. I really do believe it's just different. It's like anything else. You're in GI, right? So when I first got into GI, there were still people using fiber optic scopes. So one person in the room could see inside the patient, and that was the, the physician. Technology said, no, it's all video. Video microscopes by Sony and Olympus just came out this year. For the first time, there's a 55-inch screen monitor in a case that the physician used to just sit there and for seven hours and look into a microscope. So that doesn't mean that they became worse or better. It just that the advantages are happening. Everyone's going to eventually get there in a lot of these procedures. I do think you know, there, there may be people that don't choose to go into surgery. But I, I, I think the problem is the people that have been 15 and on years out into surgery because they feel like they're being replaced. Um, but I don't. Depending, if, if medicine is still an, uh, a, an area that people want to go into, I, I don't think it's going to slow down because of new technology. I only think it's going to enhance. I mean, we're in a video game. And that's a nonlinear growth, too. So as we look at this growth and we start to in introduce digital and all that we can get, you know, we've been li living in a linear 
um, medical device world. It's been, uh, you know, a catheter, a bigger catheter, a better catheter. But when you start to introduce data, then you start to get a nonlinear flywheel, uh, data flywheel going, yeah. and it really accelerates the technology and the, the learning of the physician, um, the advantage to the payers. So sure. that's super interesting right now as well. So you're mentioning, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. so for some reason we keep talking about the surgeon, surgeon, surgeons, right? I don't know if you notice that. But think about it, today, yes, the procedure is a surgeon, but I don't think that we're missing the other stakeholders in the room. For example, in the US, you have physician assistant, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you do uh, cardiovascular surgery, a lot of them can remove the cephalous vein to have the, as a preparation for a bypass surgery, for example, right? You don't have this anywhere on the wall. You don't have it in Israel. I haven't seen it in Europe. So we have physician assistant, but what about the other people, nurses, technicians? I think their role is gonna grow as we go into the role of robotics, so it's not gonna be just the surgeon. I can tell you that we know a lot of surgeons using our exact robotics, or looking forward to, to it, uh, some of them are already using it, but they're telling us, I don't even want to come down from my room. I can have my technician and my nurse getting everything ready, mm -hmm. plan the procedure, I can see it on the screen, I just push a, push a button, that's it. Yeah. So you have to remember you're going to have different stakeholders that it's not going to be just the surgeon. And that's where the professional education, in my opinion, is going to change. It's going to educate more people, evolve some procedures that now it's not just cleaning the patient, but also putting a robot, getting it ready. And at the end of the day, I think there's another thing that we have to remember, it's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. How many of you want to be a patient in an interventional oncology procedure that it takes 150 procedures to get to the level of like being efficient? I don't want to, 150 cases? Mm -hmm. Why can't we reduce it to five cases, to three cases, right? So I think at the end of the day, this professional education we're going to explore is going to be more than just the surgeon, but it's going to be more focused on skills to get the surgery ready versus getting over the hump of, of the learning curve. And, and that's going to benefit everybody. Yeah, I just think uh, when we're talking about data, we're talking about AI and all of that, we, we, you know, we have to solve the problem of patient data and who owns it and where does it live. And, but once, once we can actually leverage all that information, um, when planning, you know, all these technologies, there's always I'm going to say always, but there's a sense of planning, right? You have to tell the machine what, what to do, but, but when you can leverage all of the procedures that have ever been done and compare it to that case today and somehow use that information, right, to, to really come up with the ultimate plan and then the surgeon can simply accept it or modify mm -hmm. it, but like that's huge, right, when we can get there. And I think that's really where big data is going to come in and AI with deep learning and machine learning and really help us see things. If you go to RSNA, 20-25% of the show now is all about AI and you know being able to identify those critical structures, things that you know the human eye couldn't even see is really really phenomenal. I think about you mentioned 150 procedures to become adequate, right? Yeah. So think about where you guys all are in your career. You have a choice to say it's going to take me 10 years before the whoever trained you right now, they may be retired, they may not, that's going to look at you and say expert or you come out with technology that's far and away ahead of where it's been. Listen, smartphones aren't new, but when something goes wrong with my smartphone, I call my kids. Can you guys fix this? Because I can't. And I'm being dead serious, right? It, it's, it's the way that things are evolving. You're an expert much faster at the next stage of medicine from where you are today than you would be if you go with traditional yeah. skills that, the, that mm -hmm. the surgeon that probably trained you went through. Yeah. And Actually, I to support that, sorry, I didn't mean to cut Yeah, you. of course. When surgical, I got into surgical navigation, I didn't actually realize how new it was. It was about 98 that I started doing surgical navigation. It was early 90s probably when surgical navigation really started. I was in upstate New York at a case with an older surgeon, and uh, we had our navigation system there. We we're going to do spine surgery. This was freehand navigation stuff, early days. And um, so before he was going to actually do the surgery, I was going to give him a little training. And I said, okay, doc, I want you to grab the mouse, right? And I was going to tell him to do some stuff on the computer. And the mouse was say my hands the mouse. He starts, like, mashing it with his palm. He's never used the mouse before. And I remember I looked at him. I said, doc, we don't have enough time. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't give him cheese. <laughs> you guys can't, you guys can't relate to that. So we just like, kind of what? aborted right, right but, there, like, this isn't going to work. But I want to give you real, real life experience to what? Uh, we said here, both of us, we, one of my companies that was sold eventually, 
we had discussions with one of the largest companies in the world. And they, had the, they were in the middle of due diligence, and all of a sudden they stopped the due diligence. So I called them, and I asked them why. And they said, well, our scientific board cannot agree if we want to use it or not. And I said, OK, can you share with me? He said, yes. We had one surgeon that said, I will never use this robot. He said, OK. And we had two surgeons saying, when can I use it? I asked them just one question. How old was the surgeon who said, I will never use it? 60. How old were the other surgeons? 35, 40. It's, it's a real life experience. The young physician said, I want it right now. It can make me better. The 60, 65 year old said, no, no, no. I will. And that's why they pulled out on us because of one surgeon, because they knew that that group will not accept it. So it's real life experience, guys. It's not what we're thinking it may be. We have to go over that hump. And I do think that the young surgeons will, I mean, you can compete from day one after medical school. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to do that? But the momentum's getting there, though. Yes. It's, no, it's yeah. definitely. Now is the time, for sure. So on the subject of training and simulation, um, and we're going to pop back into, it, into intuitive here for a second, because they're currently the platinum standard um, in regards to sales, adoption, and the use of data in the market. Mm. Um, the organization really said, Gary said at JP Morgan, that they developed a simulated environment to measure the capability of surgical teams before they go into the OR. Uh, this enables his team to practice, and it gives a company like Intuitive data to analyze and use in developing new technology. Can a surgical robotic solution be successful without a robust training and simulation platform? I, no, I don't think so. I think you have to train, at least now, at least where we are today. Once it becomes a commodity, maybe everyone knows how to use a robot. But I, I've had surgeons say, you know, maybe they use one robotic platform, and they're like, I don't need to be trained on yours. I know how to use robots. It's just, they're all so different right now, mm -hmm. and they're all so unique. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be figuring it out clinically. So how do these small startups who develop a robot, and I'm going to pull it out, you get somebody like a Transenterix, mm -hmm. right? They have a platform, regardless of what your opinion is on their technology, um, but that's a company that worked really hard to get a surgical platform out, and you wonder, does that company have enough time, money, and resources to put into a surgical robot? And are they going to be around for the next five to 10 years if they don't get acquired? What sort of impact from your experiences that, that has that had on potential buyers, meaning the hospitals or the surgery centers? I, I think you mentioned that before, and I think, I don't like that word bundling, but it is bundling. If you can have a robot a robot a lot of time allows you the access. And then you have another tool to do the procedure. A biopsy, ablation, mm -hmm. screw, deliver, anything else. Uh, we see a lot of these companies that they just have the access device sometimes. Like Mazor Robotics. Think about Mazor. It's a great access device and then Medtronic bought them and now they can use their implants to use the access device to get to that. Uh, it will take more steps to build a bag that when you go out, you, have, you can sell not just um, the robot that will allow you to get to the point, but the right sutures, the right tuckers, the right mesh maybe, um, whatever else you need to have in order to get bigger. These companies will have to invest in, um, in Profed. It's, it's a heavy lift, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, can they make it through this? Probably. Can they become as big as intuitive? It, it depending on their value proposition, of course, and what can they bring to the table that will allow them to compete in the market. Sure. But I think what they're missing is, is the platform of just the robot to allow them to get to the point, but actually do the entire procedure. I always say there's a big difference between a product and a procedure. Yep. And I think when they get to the point where they can have a procedure, uh, that's why J&J, for example, have a great advantage. I mean, they have this collaboration with Oris. Oris will allow them to get to the point, and they use New Wave, which is the ablation system, to actually complete the procedure. That's bundling. That's, that's a great power. I have something different. And, and I think that's where Globus, for example, when your robot uses your screws, yep. electronic buying Mazor, using their implants, that's a procedure versus a product. The thing is, the one, one thing though is like, I mean, just when you launch a piece of capital, I mean, field service is a big cost. Clinical support is much bigger. Because at least with service, you go out there, I mean, things go well once yeah. a year, you do your PM. You probably have a couple calls break fixed throughout the year. Clinical specialists be at every case. Talk about a huge number of people that you need, at sure. least initially. We have a lot of intuitive guys that are on our sales team now, and they were telling me that, I don't know if it's like that today, but a couple years back, the DaVinci robot, 
i said how long would it take before surgeon was really independent ready to go they said fifty surgeries right and so like for us we were hoping that they could be independent on five well that's not realistic it's not fifty though i mean we're you know probably a ten maybe you know but that's one surgeon now but then as soon as that guy uses it the other person wants to use it and then this person wants to use it you gotta be there for their cases too and then you, you know, say you launch 100 robots, how do you handle all that? Mm -hmm. you, need a, you need an army now of clinical specialists. Yeah. So does that bring us back to only the large strategics really have platforms? It's going to be really hard for a startup, right now, I think. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. the answer is yes. Right. I think the startups are going to have to partner or get acquired. Yeah. Any questions on that subject? Because that's going to roll us into what do the big tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, and Google play in the med tech digital surgery, surgical robotic field? They're partners. That's it, it's not, they're not competition. They're, if anyone feels that the number one competitors to any existing technology and medical, even those companies, are the companies that they know are out there every single day, they're fooling themselves. Your best, the biggest com competitors, in a sense, if you don't pay attention, or threats, are companies you're not looking at, but that those companies are absolute partners because data storage by itself is huge in, in those companies and working hand in hand with them. To anyone say that I'm going to go head to head with Amazon, how's that working out so far for those fields and those spaces, right? You know, so you partner mm -hmm. or you, you basically, you go away or you have something that's completely different and or better. So I, I don't think they're coming in to beat these companies. I actually think if you do it right, they're coming in to work with and to make sure, and that's what's happening. I mean, you look at, you look at Google and you look at Apple. They're not going at this alone. They're working with big strategics or other small, plenty of small companies our size they're, you know, they're looking at you know, and they're, they're working with and they're partnering with um, because there's a secret sauce there that they want. And it, it's... Small companies give those big companies the chance to, um, that becomes their R&D engine. And it's the while. access to the physician and it's the access to Absolutely. the patient that they don't have. Absolutely. Norbert, your opinion on that? So I was at a conference, I think it was about 10 years ago, it was sponsored by CIMIT. I don't know if you're familiar with CIMIT, but it was a healthcare and technology conference. It's here with Harvard, MIT, a lot of the docs from there. It was actually a really great conference. It was a pretty small group, maybe 100 of us, but they had, I think the CTO of Medtronic was there talking and one of the higher ups in Google specifically talking about this electronic patient records, and mm -hmm. these are the companies that could do it. I mean, they could put all of our records up there, of course. but they're like, how can we do it? Like, everyone's terrified of right. those companies having access to all that data. Yeah. So, although well, they could do it they tomorrow. Need you. Right, they need you though, you can be a great- it becomes a political help. thing, and, then, and like, I don't know how to solve that, and they don't either, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but that's how I see them partnering. They could, they could do all the, yep. all the big data aspects of it, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, so. Because, you know, I look at some of these partnering going on, and in particular, the, the Google and J&J &J collaboration with Verb. I don't think Google has any interest in developing a surgical robot. But I think they have a one. ton of interest in the data that comes off that robot. And I think that's what you're going to see more of yeah, in absolutely. those areas. I just, they'll let the med tech companies get the employees, the footprint, the square footage, the facilities down in Mexico, the HR issues, all <laughs> handle the regulatory barriers, do the clinicals, but I don't think we see um, them having any interest in anything other than data. Well, think about it. There's 230 million surgeries annually and about 100 or so million that could be done still. If you're in those, if you're those companies, it sounds crazy, but that's not the market. We're the market. Every everyday people are way more than 200. This, how many hundreds of millions of people are there in the world that they're basically focused on on a daily basis? So yes, they're going to partner with medical companies, but not looking to take over medical. It's just a nice little, believe it or not, that that, that small amount of procedures, 230 million procedures, is you know those are rounding errors for those kind of companies, but they want access to it for the records and the data. They're not going to drive it. Question. <coughs> I was wondering if you could speak a little to the kinds of data that we're expecting from surgical robotics in terms of how we can use that data because I know that right now much of the data is more on the physician side in terms of how are they using the device. It's not so much the patient data. Um, so I was just wondering what do you anticipate the main value being from this big data that tech companies like Google are trying to collect? 
I, mean, I, I can answer that just in the spine community, the, the, the surgeons in the spine community, and there's not a, really, a, in the scheme of things, not a ton of spine surgeons out there, but right. they're, it seems like every single one of them is a researcher and they publish mm. and, they, and they talk and they have a very tight community. And they, you know, the, the development and just the implants and the different procedures is just constantly evolving. And they, these guys love data. And they want to see, and, then they're, and they're open to their failures too, which is really remarkable. And, they want to see, like, if you plan screws, you know, unilaterally versus bilaterally, and if you do this, and if I use this construct, like, what's the outcome's going to be? And if I fuse these three layers, do I have adjacent disc disorder? And, mm -hmm. and they're all trying to learn from one another. Um, I mean, it was probably, what, 30, 40 years ago, there wasn't even a pedicle screw in existence. You know what I mean? It's come so far so fast. And so I think that's what they want to see. They want to measure the procedure they did today with outcomes later. That's the kind of stuff they want to yeah. see, right? So, so how physicians do they share their experience and knowledge? Yep. How? They go to conferences mm -hmm. once a year, twice a year, right? And they sit down for three days and they see all the <laughs> presentation and then, wow, he did this or that. Think about the fact, I'm, I'm echoing exactly what was said here in our system, for example, one of our companies in interventional oncology. Okay, if you use a 17 gauge for an 80 year old patient going after the liver <laughs> at a 20% um, angulation, you better do X, Y, Z. You don't have to wait until you see that once a year presentation yeah. that if I use that. A physician in the middle of a surgery facing something, in his head he may go through 1,000 procedures. Oh, I've seen that before. Think about it that in like a split a second, something can tell the physician or the robot millions of procedures and compare it and give him the information. Th that's huge. That will allow them to keep learning as they're doing the procedure. And, and that's what I'm saying. Everybody said about Google and Apple. I'm actually excited about the companies we didn't even know yet. Mm -hmm. ADOC, mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you heard of ADOC. Companies like those that eventually will know how to take this new data that right. we're collecting and analyze it in a way that Apple, Google never thought about. I'm excited to see these companies, you know, come to surgical robotics. We don't talk about cybersecurity. Somebody can log into your robot from distance, right? Well, we talk about it. But. Yeah, we do, so we do talk about it here. We don't talk about it here, and we don't hear a lot of companies, cybersecurity for med, but think about so it. Yeah. Yeah, that's another part we yeah, will need when we come well, to that, that's it's, blowing up, right? It's, yeah. it's <laughs> coming from the big, large companies. Exactly. Um, cybersecurity has been, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually major, 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 major meetings and discussions. And so that's where teams. I'm excited yeah, about this information right. we're going to get. Sure. Um, well, like the hospital networks, if you try to get your robot into some of these big hospital groups. We've gotten 80 page agreements on cybersecurity, HIPAA compliance. They treat robots as if we're a server in their server rack. I mean, it's, it's serious stuff. Sometimes I feel like we're worse than the Russians when we could <laughs> like a robot. Yeah, data, data, I think, and uh, when you look at AI in certain procedures, so look at GI, you know, I'm only going back to it. So there's 14 million colonoscopies done in the United States every year. So a doctor's doing a case. And she sees, a, she sees a polyp, and she's 100% sure that small little sessile polyp is not cancerous. Today, she has to snare it, send it off to pathology. Doctors are looking to resect and discard, and then take the ones that they really know are serious and send them off to pathology. But they know that X a percentage are not. So with the data and with AI and understanding the more and more and more procedures that are done, I'm going to know that we're going to get to the point that she can resect it and discard it, and we're going to save healthcare a lot of money, and we're going to get a focus on the patient. She's also going to have the opportunity to visualize other areas of the colon that might be more cancerous and more problematic that she's not seeing today because of data and AI and the work that's been done. So I think the opportunities are actually real-time cases. Data is going to play a huge factor. I'm not even talking about patient data and all the... It, that's a bumper sticker. Everyone says we have all the data, but no one knows what to do with that yet. And there's one more thing that this may lead us to do. And I really like the idea that came from the CEO of Metronic. And I think they're having like a pilot somewhere. Is pay for success. Mayo. Right? Is it Mayo? Mm -hmm. I forgot where it was. Omar, Omar, them, and United are working together on that. Correct. But eventually, if we have all this data, we can analyze, we know what to expect, what are the outcomes, we can set it as the bar. And we can say, if you reach it, you get paid. If you don't, you have to pay. Whatever we define it. But eventually, we can reduce a lot of cost for the failed surgeries. Because once we know how to make them successful, you did something wrong, <laughs> you failed, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. That's the bottom line. 
Yeah, and, and looking on the data subject, so right now this panel primarily, and most of us have a mindset of data in a surgical setting. Well, let's put things in perspective. The iPhone's 11 years old and Facebook is 15 years old. Um, now we're a little bit older than you guys, but that seems like yesterday to me when, when those hit, you guys might have not been consciously in, um, you know, around without those in your, in your life, right? But when you think about data, we should look at data beyond the surgical suite. I think we need to look mm -hmm. at data and under, under the understanding of healthcare as a total continuum. So step back and look at 23andMe on a predictive analytics side. Step back, if my 13-year-old child, I know in five years that I'm gonna be able to self-pay and get a little Band-Aid that he can put on his chest that will get, capture two dozen biometrics on him and I'll have a baseline on him from the age of 13 all the way through and that'll get downloaded somewhere. Right. And then I'll take that data for health and prevention and then God forbid he has to go in for surgery somewhere. And we have an entire baseline that we can diagnose a lot quicker and a lot earlier in the situation. And it's not catastrophic on, uh, 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 on a table somewhere trying to you know, close the barn door, but we're doing preventive medicine. And God forbid he has to go into surgery. And now we're gonna have all that data. And then post, and the payers are gonna line up for this, right? The med tech companies are gonna line up for this. The data companies are going to line up for this. So I think we have to be super careful not to look at data from a surgical perspective That's exclusively. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to look at data from an entire healthcare. And all the components mm -hmm. are out there. 23andMe has no interest in telling you that you're Lebanese. Right? They have all interest in the world of telling you right, what your credit card number is, where you live, what you're predisposed for, the data they didn't give you. Mm -hmm. And right now, they're already selling that for clinical trials. So I think when you think about data, you have to look well beyond the surgical suite. And unfortunately, that's what everybody's fixated on right now. Well, you have post-acute care recovery time. This, everyone has, people have Fitbits. So you're going into orthopedics. Orthopedic surgeons today are basically putting Fitbits on their patients, medical grade. So you know what, you, don't, you, you tell me you're walking, I don't believe you, prove it. And that's hooked up right to the doctor. It's all communicating to, together. So that's post-acute care recovery. I want to keep you out of this hospital for readmission rates. I want to make sure you're on your feet and you're doing what you're supposed to do. That's all, and that collects data. Average patients up and doing this many steps. It's, I mean, it's measuring how many steps you're taking a day and the data uh, after you do this procedure with this type of total knee or total hip. This is what the patients can do. This is their BMI, so we know what they can do. And the average at this BMI, at, at this day post-op, can take this many steps over years and years of collecting that. And that's using Fitbit technology that wasn't devised for medical. You know, it's, it's great technology, but you know what I'm saying. We all wear it just to run around. So, I mean, there's so many things that are being done with the, the data that's not surgical in nature. So there's pros and cons to all of this, right? And like the 23andMe stuff, maybe I'm old school, but that terrifies me just from the movie Gattaca. <laughs> you see that? Um, but what sort of things do you guys think about when you think of the cybersecurity risks, the data risks? What sort of legal ramifications are on you versus a hospital versus anyone else? Like just kind of high level, what are you thinking of when it comes to all of those riskier and also public opinion areas? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I can start there if you want. So right, right now, like our robot, um, we're, we're, right now we're 100% inside the hospital. So if somebody gets to our robot, they're getting through the hospital's firewall, it's kind of on them, really. But soon, you know, we want to be able to do cloud storage and do other things and allow surgeons to plan from their home or plan from ever, you know, wherever. And so that's what we're you know, heavily looking on now is and you just have to kind of follow, you know, everything's encrypted, every, you know, transport as well as your packets are encrypted, and, and there's, there's standards out there that you can follow. Um, you know, we'll most likely leverage something like the Amazon Cloud because they do a really good job of protecting their, their, their cloud, and they work with companies to make sure that you're hardened, you know, and that, you know, they can't, you can't get hacked into. So mm -hmm. this is kind of a journey we're currently on and looking into, and it's a, it's a huge effort. Um, you know, we were even talking as a, as a company, I mean, do you need a cybersecurity officer now? Like, you, you know, like, you have to it's just, that's where it's getting to, you know, between the, HIPAA and yeah. cybersecurity, it's like you just, the expertise level, you know, most of us yeah. don't have that kind of expertise, you so, know, so that's something that we gotta seriously consider. So, sorry to interrupt, it. when you just said that, it yeah. made me think, to do business in healthcare now, Health Trust is one of the, the, the three or four major group purchasing organizations. They're very compliant though. 
there you can't come in with technology without them having they have five paragraphs in their contracts on cybersecurity and you have to meet their needs to be on the contract and, and I only say this now I'm in a small company it's kind of cool I was at Olympus which is a major scope uh, telemedicine with an acquisition of image stream medical and system integration and every I mean to get the con you had to make sure so our team had to the organization had to bring on um, yeah. There were people on the legal team that their job was to make sure cyber, then cybersecurity in the language of contracts, yeah. and it, it depends, you know, how large you're going across. Small technologies, we might have some opportunities, uh, but when as they grow, it's it, it was it's amazing to get into the doors of a Kaiser, to get into the doors of Ascension Health, to get into the doors of these major IDNs and players, the Geisinger Health System now because their own payer network and all of that. You have to show your your cybersecurity. You're not playing. Mm -hmm. I think That's just normal. Three, Sorry. I think the three items that I will be concerned when it comes to sharing the data. I'm, I'm not concerned about the cybersecurity. I mean, it's going to be there. We're going to block it. Right. But this data is going to be not just in the U.S. but globally eventually. So number one, privacy. Right. It, it's it's information that it, it is mm -hmm. very very private, and I hate. I have two young girls seven and five almost, and I will hate anybody to know what they suffer from or change their thing. One, second one is the abuse of the information. Mm -hmm. Are we using it for the right things or are we using it for the wrong things, right? And, and the third one is really legal exposure. Now we're going to take this data, as Joe mentioned, and we're going to make decisions based right. on data. That's legal exposure. So those are the three things that I think we will need to overcome when we're looking into the big data analysis. But again, um, Agreed. we want to be there. We got to find ways to overcome them. Yeah, absolutely. The let's pivot now because we're on an MBA program, and so I want to go towards business for entrepreneurs and just business in general. Um, since we're speaking to this audience, and they have more of a choice in declaring their field of study, should they pursue a broader path or a sub-specialization in the field of healthcare, robotics, and or digital health from where they're sitting right now? Listen, you, you, you have to, one thing I'll tell you, you guys are highly educated. You're doing a great thing. Those that have gone through med school and now you're doing this, those that have gone through uh, other business, now that you're doing this as well. You have to go to areas that you really love and want to do. Because I, I will tell you that um, in today's environment, you guys are from a generation that is instant gratification. If you have a question, you just ask Siri. And we used to use encyclopedias. I don't even, they might have some in Harvard, I feel like I'm sure. But you don't even go in those libraries. They look like they're for show. But I say that because, <laughs> because if you don't, you're, you're going to get bored. You need to go where you really want to be. So it's, it's easy to say go big, go small, go, listen. When you know what field you want to go in, I've, I've, I've been in medical since I got out of college. I've been very lucky and I had no intention in coming into it. But I've been able to challenge myself and then you own your careers. And I would say this no matter what job you go to. Get to your job, do your work, but build your career. Make sure you're getting exposure and work with your managers or leaders or, and you're challenging yourself because you, it's up to you to get promoted. No one else will ever tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, I really like you. Do you want to be promoted one day? Never going to happen. You got you to make that career. I, I like the question, but I, I don't want to limit it to say, well, you should go robotics. You know what? If someone said to me they, they want to go work on designing new Foley bags in urology, go for it. If you love well, that's it, the subspecialization, so yeah. let me position it better. Is, is should somebody remain broad in nature, or should they get into a subspecialization as they build out? I, I'll, I'll give you an advice, take this an advice or not, that I got from one, one of my mentors. You're way younger than me, I assume. And he told me, you at an age that whatever you decide to do, you're not going to go wrong. And he was 100% right. I'm a great believer in you can be everything to everybody, but when it comes to your career, you got to have broad experience. Okay? So when I became a CEO, when I took one of my, pub my portfolio companies public, guess where I was? Right there, taking two weeks of executive education for finance. Why? I'm not the CFO of the company, but I needed to understand better finance for public company. I needed to broaden my experience. So my opinion is you go broad, you explore, you try, you fail, it's great, try it again, and you find something that 
you really like to do, you really love to do, because I cannot agree <coughs> more. I was in a great position at J&J at a very young age, and I left because it wasn't there anymore. Right. And I love what I do today for the past eight years. Mm -hmm. And I tried, and, and I failed, and I tried again, and somebody else will tell you if I'm successful or not. It's not for me to say. But the fact that you try broader, and you learn a lot, and then you find the niche that you love and you're passionate about, is it I know I'm going to love robotics? No. But I got to tell you. You know what changed my mind about robotics? I have a second to tell the story. Let me tell you a story. I started as a sales rep for Johnson & Johnson in Israel. And I went to meet uh, a general surgeon and talk to him about our new mesh for hernia uh, that we just brought up from Ethicon. Now, Ethicon is the largest company in the world medical device back then for J&J. &J. And I went to his office and I said, Dr. So-and-so, I'm being respectful to him. I said, do you know the recurrent? I didn't finish saying recurrences. He threw me out of his office. He said, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I don't have recurrences. So I went home. And I thought about it, and I said, J&J is a smart company. If they came up with this mesh, there's a need. I came back to his office two days later. First thing I did, I apologized. Second thing I did, I said, doctor, do you know all the recurrences you get from the other centers that you need to fix? He said, I see them all the time. <laughs> smart. True story. <laughs> yeah. But when I start thinking about it, when I left J&J, and I start looking into what portfolio companies I want to build, that story got stuck to me. I said, you know what? That's the problem. The problem is that there is no variability. There is variability. There is no like democratize, democratization along the surgery, and surgeons won't tell you that. So we need to try to bring it to the table. So again, that's what I'm excited about. Mm. It took me a while to get it to that point, but it started by being very broad. So my take on that, I, I almost think I personally feel you probably can't go wrong. Go broad, go deep. I don't know if it matters. I, I can't tell you how many PhDs I know, but by definition, PhDs go deep, right? That are doing stuff that's completely different, but they learn good skills there. And I, I'm a high believer of believing your ability to learn. I mean, I started a company when I was 28 building a CAT scanner. I never built a CAT scanner before, but figured, I figured I could figure it out, and I did. You know, I was accepted at MIT for a PhD, and I told myself, you know, I'd rather go work that hard for myself. You know, forget about that. And that's what we did, you know? So for me, it's just, you know, you're all smart, we're all smart, you just, you just go do it, you know? So pick one, learn a lot, and you'll have transferable skills into what you wind up landing into. I think you'll definitely land on your feet. Yeah, and to that point, I think everybody sitting up here today, by definition of success, none of us imagined we'd be in the career we're in right now. Hey, I played basketball. At your age. <laughs> I played basketball, for God's sake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and Todd was a baseball player. Right. <laughs> I was a black sheep of my mom. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. No doctor, no lawyer. Yeah, exactly. But uh, echoing but what Todd said, you, I, you know, I've, well, I've, 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 had mil I've had millions <laughs> of conversations, <laughs> probably close to millions of conversations with people over my 30 years of search um, and giving a lot of guidance to careers. And actually, we've had conversations. Um, and I, I would say what Todd said is pick something that you're absolutely in love with and, and never chase the money ever because there's going to be days that the world and the business is going to try and break you. It, it has to. It's just life. And unless you're in love with what you're doing, you're going to quit and turn away to do something else. And so, you know, when people says do what you love, I don't think it's to satiate yourself. I think it's the hedge against the shit storm you're about to face if you're really going to do something amazing. Because if you're going to do something amazing, you're going to get punched in the face many times a month. And unless you're loving what you're doing, you're going to quit and then you're going to shift and pivot again. And that's cool because that meant you didn't love that and you weren't trying to paint the masterpiece. Mm -hmm. So that would be my advice mm -hmm. to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a roller coaster. Don't get upset at it either. I mean, just by the way, everyone's boss that day treated them bad. So you're not alone. My boss hates me. No one cares, first of all. Just do your thing. You know, it, it's, it's funny. I mean, I've always said the best job I ever had in my life was being a first line regional sales manager. It's still the best job. I couldn't imagine ever having more fun. People you hire, you're spending time with, you're going to speak to doctors and you're running around with them. But I was also a psychiatrist, a psychologist, because every single <laughs> night I'd have 10 phone calls of, I'm ready to jump off the ledge. I can't believe they're not saying yes to my proposal or this or that or whatever. Okay, be there for people. And also, don't be afraid to, if you have an issue, talk about it. But don't just jump. I mean, I, I like your advice is right. 
but you don't have to fail and then try something else. You could be great at the first thing you do and just keep advancing. But, but you know, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's actually pretty cool. And it doesn't mean that you don't fail along the way, but don't just give up on things. And I think that's, uh, you know, if you, if you have a plan to go somewhere right now, do it until you find somebody else that tells you you're going on a better one. Along those lines, what are the challenges that our audience should be sensitive to as they launch their own venture in healthcare robotics or digital health? What should, what should be the list of five things they should be considerate of? Funding, 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 funding. If they're, so, if they're surgeons? What's that? What if they're doctors? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Yeah. I, I, oh, you, oh, go ahead. No, please. Uh, like, oh, oh, I, I, would, I would just say that the biggest lesson that I learned, and I use this whenever I make a decision, is uh, know the difference between being reckless and taking a risk. Mm -hmm. And the difference is being able to live with the failure. So no matter what you do, just make sure you can live with the failure, and then it's just a risk. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I, um, I give lectures at some universities like uh, over the US and Europe, and I talk about entrepreneurship. And a lot of people I speak to, they say, well, the number one thing, I really want to go into entrepreneurship, and I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't have an idea. Really, do you need to have an idea? I did not invent anything in all of my portfolio companies. But I collaborated with smart people, like Professor Moshe Shoham, who's the founder of Mazor Robotics, and other people that had great ideas, and I was able to work with them to build the company. So number one is, you want to be an entrepreneur? Don't be mistaken between inventor and entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Right. Okay? So that's number one. If you really want to be an entrepreneur, find the, find the opportunity. The second one is, never build a company for an exit. Build a company to build a company. If along the way somebody's going to come in and give you a nice check, great. Mm -hmm. But if not, guess what? You're going to fail. And I've seen that so many times. And the last thing is, I always tell people, strategies and objectives are meant for only one reason, so you can change them. Especially when you're an entrepreneur, you go in and things change, you can get different feedback, the market change, new competitors, something happened, okay? So don't be afraid to have a great strategy and a great goals, but don't be afraid to change them along the way if you need to fit it into what's happening in the market. And I always tell people, well, fail fast. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather invest $100,000 in a company and close it after six months than give them $3 million and let them fool around for three years. If you, you, you guys are smart. You're at Harvard already, right? So obviously, you have something that I did. I, I did not go to Harvard. So you already have some skills that many people don't have. So you fail fast, you learn, you move on. That, that's the way I see it. That's an entrepreneur. Trust me. Mm -hmm. The times I failed, Michael Jordan once said that. I failed over and over and over again. This is why I succeed. And he's 100% right, guys. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to be successful. I would give a couple simple ones. Emotional intelligence is so much more important than IQ. Mm -hmm. So much more in the world. People have a, you can be really book smart. You have to understand people. You have to understand empathy. You have to understand the business market that you're in. And don't be egoless. Have an ego. Believe in yourself that you're great, but be egoless outside. Don't ever be afraid to work with, and as you're growing your careers, hire people better than you. Because you want to be looked at as a great leader? Bring on experts. That, I look for experts that tell me what they need, and then I'm going to set them up. I'm going to hold them accountable. We're going to get them the right things that they need. But if you hi I've had bosses that they hire people with the goal of telling them what to do in their specialties. Those bosses don't succeed and most people leave. The number one reason why people leave a company is they fire their boss, just so you know that. So have, have EQ, have, be emotionally intelligent and then be egoless and don't be afraid to empower others around you and you'll be great leaders. Mm -hmm. On the ego thing, so I believe the, the great leaders I've seen um, have huge egos. Mm -hmm but they balance it out with humility. And the lousy leaders have huge egos and have no humility. So you need, if you're gonna be successful, you need to have an enormous ego. And if you're gonna lead people, you need to have humility as well. And to Todd's point on EQ, and especially, I'm gonna guess in this room, the IQ on that side of the table is probably bigger than on this side of the table. But I'm gonna take this side of the table to win because on this side of the table, I look at 
EQ and IQ together. IQ is the lever that gets underneath the mass I'm trying to move. EQ increases the length of that lever arm. And so when I look at powerful people, they have enough of an IQ to get underneath, but they have massive IQ to make that lever seven foot long. And you can't have an IQ seven foot long. Doesn't exist. So on that point, using pure physics as an example, that's what I've seen with great leaders. Any questions right now where we are? So one, one comment, you, know, you had talked about um, being able to pivot, essentially, like when we talk about intuitive, what really strikes me with intuitive is, we had said they started out in neurology, they started out, and, and these are a smart, smart group of people came out of Stanford, right? Tons of, tons of investments, probably one of the best groups, right, for start, starting something that complex, and yet they still had to pivot. Kind of, it it, it kind of shows you that humility, no matter how good your market analysis is, no matter how, how good a job you do, you still have to be ready to pivot. Uh, my old business partner used to always say, like, we were building our x-ray system, and we thought we were building a great system, and he had this thing that says, you don't know if the dogs are going to eat the dog food. You, know, you just got to kind of get it out there and see, are they going yeah. to eat it, you know? Yeah. And if they don't, we, we got to pivot, you know? Right. <laughs> so that's what right. happened with Intuitive, right? I, yeah. The urologist didn't want to use it. The, uh, <laughs> the, flip, the flip side is um, make the first batch of dog food and put it in front of some dogs, and if the customer likes it, then keep building it. So right. we, don't forget the customer. You got to have right. voice of customer. Intuitive is famous for when they first started. They're so smart, they just created things and told everyone what to use, yeah. and people did use it because it was kind of cool. Right. But if you ask doctors, say, man, they, they, don't, they don't take the physicians in, in mind at the beginning, like yeah. you guys yeah. do. Agreed. Right, right, right. You know, so. All right, so I want to finish up with some fun here. One sentence or less, speed round. We're uh -oh. going to start on this one with Todd. Upon graduation, do you go to work for someone else or do you start your own company? One sentence. Someone else. Hurry up. You gotta jump off the bridge and build your wings on the way down. Someone else. Just someone else. Question two: Do you go to the <laughs> do you go to the venture community for your financing, or do you find another path? Let me start with Norbert. Uh, angels, surgeons. That's who we went to. Family offices, angels. Todd. Whoever is willing to give me money. <laughs> <laughs> no rules. Question three, starting with Harrell: Does today's big med tech know what to do with data, or do they need to partner with big tech? They need to partner. Norbert? They probably need to partner. Todd? They need to partner. Todd. <laughs> Todd, starting with you. Your best friend was just starting out today. Which market would you recommend they develop a robotic or digital health solution for? Obviously, I would think data, but I'm not sure I'd But give me a disease state. In other words, ortho, ophthalmology. Endoluminal therapies. Endoluminal therapies. Flexible uh, Neurovascular. I think neurovascular is years behind everything else. Norbert? I'll go to sectomies. It's fine. Because that's what he does. That, that's what he does. And you do endoluminal, right? And then finally, uh, I'm going to throw this one at Harrell first. Do Tom Brady and Bill Chel Belichick come back next year? Absolutely. But that's not the right question. <laughs> Will we, my, my young girls keep asking me. This is me. the speed round. I know. No, no, that's it. That's it. You're but done. My young, my young girls keep asking me, will we see Gronk dance next year again? <laughs> Norbert, does, do Tom Brady and Bill yes. Belichick come back next year? Yes. Todd? Not interested. I'm a Giants fan. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And certainly thanks for the panel here. I mean, this is a lot of talent and a lot of experience. I don't know if you understand how lucky you are. So thank you, gentlemen. Joe, because you didn't let me have my presentation, <laughs> I want to give, I'm serious, I love that presentation, but um, let me just tell you one story. Leave this with you about the future of robotics, okay? When is it and everything else? How many of you heard of Jules Verne? 1870, Jules Verne wrote a book, To the Moon and Back. It took the Russians until 1957 that's 87 years to send, remember Sputnik? Sure. Mm -hmm. Up to orbit. It took the US another 12 years, that's 99 years, to send Apollo to the moon. Okay, from a book that was written. And today we talk about SpaceX, right? About Virgin Atlantic, mm -hmm. just today Bernstein said he's gonna travel. So everything, I think it's like here and it's normal. But think about it, it took us almost 150 years to get this done. Robotics started in 1948. Do you know that? 
do you know that intuitive surgical started at GE in 1948? And in 1972, NASA actually came up with the idea of doing something similar to the master slave and do it telesurgery. And then 20 years later, intuitive surgical actually came to life. So if you take the same path, we're right at the time when robotics is going to explode. So if any of you think that, well, robotics talking about 50 years from now, just take that simple example. And we're right there. It may take five years, 10 years, but that's what we're going to see. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you. Well, thank you all. And a hand for uh, our panel, please. <laughs>